Okay, we are live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Pinto from Phoenixville Public Library, and welcome to tonight's presentation about a very interesting, unusual period in our American history, and one that Pennsylvanians can certainly uh, relate to in uh, particular. We're pleased to have with us tonight uh, a frequent guest of the library, Roger Arthur. Roger has a master de master's degree in American history from Westchester University, currently teaches history classes for Chester County Night School, and uh, retired not too long ago as a teacher from Bishop Shanahan High School in Downingtown. So please welcome Roger. Roger, take it away. Thank you. Uh, good. Well, tonight's presentation is about prohibition. And the reason I chose to present Prohibition this year is that this is the 100th anniversary of the ratification or the, the uh, uh, America experiencing Prohibition live. And the question is, why would they do that? And the simple answer was it seemed like a good idea at the time. But what you wish for and what you get are not always the same thing. And those of you who can see my background, I chose this background on purpose. This is the saloon in the Irma Hotel in Cody, Wyoming. And the reason that I chose uh, the saloon at the Irma is that they have the most unique back bar of any place that I've ever been. This back bar was made I think somewhere in the east and came out uh, in pieces by wagon because the railroad wasn't even there yet when it was put in. For those of you not familiar where Cody is, Cody, Wyoming is uh, just uh, off the east entrance of Yellowstone National Park and it is the hometown of Buffalo Bill Cody. And if you ever get a chance to stop in, it's a delightful little town. Prohibition, the noble experiment, Herbert Hoover called it. Why would America all of a sudden enact prohibition as part of a constitutional amendment? Well, they didn't do it right away. Uh, Americans had been drinking for quite some time. Uh, one of the Englishmen said, Americans drink for everything. If they win a bet, they drink. If they go to a horse race, they drink. If they win the race, they drink. If they lose the race, they drink. You know, they get up in the morning and they have, uh, they have a drink before they go to work. The noon whistle blows and they have beer with their lunch. And, and it wasn't just the average people. It was, you know, many, many people, many, uh, it, was, it was common. And it was not unusual at all for Americans to consume over 80 gallons of uh, spiritous fluids in a year's time. And it wasn't limited to just adults either. They gave it to the children. So, and, and you know, men would drink in saloons. And saloons were only for men, at least gentlemen. And then the, the females who were in the saloons were not uh, of ladies of good repute. So men would drink in saloons and they'd spend their money in the saloons and then go home with uh, tipsy sometimes and uh, beat the wife and kids. And it was as much to calm and, and get rid of, of social and, and family violence as it was to get rid of, of, of alcohol. Men would gamble in saloons. So if they didn't spend their money drinking, they could lose their money gambling. Either way, they came home broke. And some men were entertained in saloons. And I won't describe what kind of entertainment that was, but you can use your imagination. By the way, the dance hall girls did very little dancing. In the early 1830s, America went through what they called the Second Great Awakening. 
the first Great Awakening took place in seven in the 1730s, and the second one took place in the 1830s. And and think about America on the frontier. It isn't that they had plenty of people, but there were people on the frontier, but there was no kind of organized religion. There were no churches or or uh, regular uh, meetings of of God at all, and many so. There were revival meetings that traveled on the frontier to uh, bring the frontiersmen more in, in, in tune with the Holy Spirit and to bring them religion and r remind them of God's purpose. In 1848, a women's rights convention was held in Seneca Falls, New York. And there they published a declaration of, sen of sentiments. And these were women who were convinced that women were people too and that they should have equal rights with men. And you would think that there were only ladies there, but in fact, there were gentlemen as well. And part of the list of declaration of sentiments was uh, an objection to the use of demon rum, alcohol. And the subjects of the Second Great Awakening included religion. They wanted to get rid of slavery. They wanted to allow women the right to vote. They wanted prohibition and the closing of the saloons. They wanted free soil and they wanted to rid America of child labor. So this was quite a reform movement in the early part of the 19th century. And they had uh, political parties there, there was a suffrage party, there was an anti-slavery party, there was a prohibition party and, and a free soil party. And there are no pictures of any presidents in the White House who were the uh, primary candidate of any of these groups. But they were an expression of how some people felt and they wanted to make it national. By 1873, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was founded in Evanston, Illinois. And you can see the, the uh, uh, disclaimer of the ladies in the picture, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. Uh, understandable, I think. The Anti-Saloon League was founded some years later, and it was the Anti-Saloon League, probably more than any other single organization that offered a remedy to the saloons. And they were not necessarily against drinking, but they were against the saloon. And they started movements, and, and you see here this, this poster, the saloon or the boys and girls. The saloons had to go, and you know, there were the Anti-Saloon League held a, a, a march in Washington, D.C., along with suffragists, uh, and that uh, march was held in 1913, and it wasn't long before uh, uh, there were uh, constitutional amendments offered in both houses of Congress. Wayne Wheeler, was probably the most important mover and shaker of the Anti-Saloon League. This man was a political organizer who literally set the standard of political organization. So if you want, if you have some favorite subject that you would like enacted into law, read, read what we, Wayne Wheeler did and, and he was the most successful. He was from Ohio. He became the director of the Ohio Anti-Saloon League in 1903. He had a bachelor's from Oberlin College, and he had a, a law degree from Case Western Reserve Law School. He organized, and, and, and he, he went to uh, politicians, and he said, I don't care what else you stand for. He said, I want you to stand for the, this part of the Anti-Saloon League. And he kept track of not only if they were elected to office, but how they voted once they got into office. And he would uh, uh, primary against them if they didn't vote his way. And he became so powerful, not just in Ohio, but throughout the country, that uh, at national political conventions, he would sit up in the gallery and more than one politician would glance up to see how uh, Wheeler was, was uh, uh, nodding on this candidate or that candidate. 
there were advertisements and propaganda for prohibition and you can see here that uh, barrels of booze and carrying signs, the Hun Rule Association, and we make people poor, we cause poverty and crime, we are against progress, we rob women and children, we fill, uh, rest, uh, we fill uh, penitentiaries and asylums, and we waste grain. Waste, ruin, and, and so on. And you wouldn't think that wasting grain was all that big a deal, but it was. In 1913, the United States of America enacted the 16th Amendment, which allowed legal income tax. There had been an income tax uh, levied against the citizens of America during the Civil War, but by 1867, the Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional. They were only permitted, the Constitution says you could only levy tax by capitation, that is by, by count. So you weren't allowed to levy tax on income. Well, in 1913, the Anti-Saloon League supported a, an income tax. And what that did for the first time was allow your government in Washington to tax income. Now, it wasn't for everybody. They were just going to tax the rich. Anybody who made more than $10,000 a year would, would be subject to the income tax. And the tax rate was only 1% of the income in excess of $10,000 at the beginning. It's significantly different now. What's important about the 16th Amendment is that now the government, even though there's a, there's a tax on whiskey, that is not the primary subsidy to the United States government. The primary subsidy to the United States government, their primary source of income is now tariff and income tax, not alcohol. In December of 1913, the Anti-Saloon League and the WCTU marched uh, down the street down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington side by side. And that date is significant because it was on that date that two congressmen, Senator Morris Shepard of Texas and Senator uh, and Representative Richmond Hobson of Alabama, both introduced an amendment that would prohibit the use of alcohol as a beverage. The manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquor for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. And those, um, those amendments were introduced in both the House and the Senate on the same day by these two gentlemen. And people thought, this is ridiculous. The, the, the people will never, never agree to such a thing. America will never ban alcohol. This is a map of the United States showing prohibition. The, the dark parts of the map, where it's under license law, you could only sell alcohol by license, and the white parts of the map were under prohibitory law, which meant that it was outlawed completely. And in some places, there's no licensed territory. In other places, there are no licensed townships and so forth. And you can see, for example, Wisconsin, you know, there are a lot of little dots in Wisconsin and New York and New England and so forth. And you can see that Pennsylvania is uh, almost completely dry by 1914. Well, in 1914, in June of that year, Gabrielo Princep shot Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary. And the result of the nations surrounding Austria-Hungary was declarations of war. The Russians declared war on the Austro-Hungarians and because the Germans were pledged to support their friends, the Austro-Hungarians, they declared war on Russia. And because Russia had an agreement with the French, the French declared war on the Germans and the Germans on them. And between June 28th of 1914 and August 5th of the same year, uh, a Europe that had been at peace for almost 100 years started World War I. 
Now, the United States did not join World War I at all. We offered to mediate that our president, Woodrow Wilson, was a, uh, had been a history professor at Princeton University. Later, he was president of Princeton University and then governor of New Jersey and elected president in 1912. He offered to mediate uh, the struggle in Europe to, to come to some peaceable conclusion. Uh, the Europeans uh, look at Americans as rum-swilling, Indian-killing, backwoods rubes. They thought of themselves as the most sophisticated, the most educated, the most civilized people on earth. And if you look at Europe at the time, there was the German Empire, the French Empire, the British Empire, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Italian Empire wannabe, what's left of the Spanish and Portuguese empires, the Ottoman Empire. And if you looked at the world that those people ruled in 1914, 65% of the population of the world was ruled by the crown heads of Europe. So they thought that empire was a way of life and they thought it was permanent. They had no other concept that, that, that imperialism was the way of life. Well, when the United States declared war on the Germans in 1917, and you know, there's a whole, we could, that's a whole other talk as to why we would do that. But in, in any event, we did do that. And what that meant was that Americans uh, the dries immediately jump into this idea and says, we already have enemies at home. There's the Schlitz, the Pabst, the Blatz, and the Mueller's. Not to mention Anheuser-Busch. So all of a sudden, the manufacturers of beer and whiskey uh, come under a tremendous amount of scrutiny because they were now users of grain. To help the boys as they go overseas, America started to conserve and we had meatless Mondays and wheatless Wednesdays and it was quite fashionable to do without uh, the use of grain for almost any reason. And these these breweries and these distillers, of course, their products are made from grain alcohol. People thought that the 13th Amendment would never be ratified. They were given seven years to ratify the 13th or the, the, the 18th Amendment. In January, January 16th of 1919, Nebraska became the 36th state to ratify the amendment. And they did that on the 16th day of January 1919. The amendment said that from one year after the ratification of this amendment, it shall go into effect. And what people thought they were going to get was, you know, the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquor for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. That's what the amendment said. But people thought that it was prohibition for someone else. They didn't think it would apply to them. They did not expect the, they, they knew the saloons were gonna close, but they knew that wine would be available. They knew that you could use alcohol for medicinal purposes and the package stores uh, would sell beer and wine, they thought. And so, you know, you could still have a, a, a glass of wine with dinner and, and a bottle of beer when you got home from work and so forth. That's what most people expected and most people believed and most people thought would happen. Well, the crux of the matter is not whether you prohibit alcohol or not, but how do you define intoxicating liquor? Congressman Volstead, for whom the act is named, defined intoxicating liquor as one half of 1% alcohol by volume, which is just a deep breath stronger than tap water. Normal beer today is about three and a half to 4%. Most wine that you buy is about 12%. One half of 1% by volume means that 
almost every type of alcohol is going to be prohibited. Now, they did allow sacramental wines to be used. The doctors could prescribe uh, alcohol for uh, diseases and prevention and so forth, such as snake bite. I don't know how you use bourbon whiskey to prevent. I don't know that the snakes know that you're drinking that or not. I, don't, I just don't understand it. Anyway, and there's a problem of enforcement. But in 1920, there were a million six hundred thousand Americans. There are 2,300 prohibition agents in the whole country at a salary of $2,500 a year. The Atlantic coastline of the United States from Maine to the Gulf of Mexico is 28,673 miles. You say, that's not true, but it is true when you count all the rivers, bays, estuaries, and so on. The Gulf Coast is 17,141. The Pacific coastline is 40,298 40, miles for a total of 88,633 miles. And, and that doesn't even count the Great Lakes. Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, Lake St. Clair, and Lake Ontario all border Canada. The only, the only Great Lake that does not border Canada is Lake Michigan. So you add the, uh, the shoreline of, of the Great Lakes to all of this, and you've got problems, and you've got Coast Guard vessels of all kinds which are charged to enforce it. The Coast Guard was part of the Treasury Department, of course, and their job is to collect the taxes. Well, they are also now tasked with pursuing the revenuers, and Americans became smugglers, and they were importing all kinds of alcohol. Well, it was against the law. So those people who import alcohol or smuggle alcohol or make alcohol or who transport alcohol in any system are now criminals. Prohibition led directly to crime. Now, one of the reasons that many Americans had objected to allowing women the right to vote, they said, if we let these women vote, the next thing you know, they'll be wearing pants and drinking in saloons and, and smoking cigars. Well, I don't know if women smoke cigars, but everything else came true. And now, because it was somewhat uh, naughty to go into speakeasies and have a drink where there was free-flowing alcohol and jazz music, uh, it became quite fashionable for uh, young ladies, reputable young ladies, to go into speakeasies. These weren't saloons. These were places of entertainment, and their suppliers were bootleggers. Probably the most famous of the bootleggers were those in Chicago, but their bootleggers were not limited to just Chicago. Every, every town, city, hamlet in the whole country had them. They were in Detroit, they were in Cleveland, they were in Indianapolis, they were in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and New York and Boston and Augusta, Maine and Augusta, Georgia. And, and you know, they were literally all over the place. One of the primary vice peddlers in Chicago in 1920 was a man named Jim Colosimo. And Jim Colosimo hired a, uh, a manager of his businesses from Brooklyn, whose name was Johnny Torrio. And Johnny Torrio came to Chicago and recognized the potential, the profit potential of selling alcohol to the people who wanted it. And Johnny Torrio tried to explain that to Big Jim Colosimo, and Colosimo didn't want to have any of it. He, he was satisfied with his other vice businesses, his, his uh, houses of ill repute and gambling dens and so forth. And it wasn't long after that that Colosimo mysteriously ended up dead. Now, Torrio himself probably didn't do it, but he had a henchman. Who, who may very well have done that, who was 21 years old from Five Points, New York, a neighborhood in Brooklyn whose name was Al Capone. Torrio saw the, the vast potential of, of alcohol 
and profitability in Chicago. So he got the gangs together, the Irish mobs and the Jewish mobs and so forth, and he explained to them, look, as long as we can work with each other, you know, you take care of your territory, I'll take care of my territory, the, the Irish can have the north side, the Italians can have the west, the south side, the, the Jews can have the, the west side and so on, there's enough money to go around for everybody. And they did that for a while. Well, you know, all of a sudden somebody tells somebody that uh, Dion O'Banion's people are having a, a shipment of, of uh, a beer coming in and beer is extremely high. You know, you can't just distill beer. It takes a while to brew it up and it takes a long time to do. So if you can hijack a, a truck full of beer, uh, you can make a lot of money on that. And, and getting it from somebody who's already gone to the trouble of, high, of, of, of brewing it is even better. Well, O'Banion's trucks got hijacked and they blamed it on Torio. And then the, there was a feud between the Torio people on the one side and the O'Banion people on the other. And some of the O'Banion people tried to kill Torio. They didn't succeed. He was coming home from, from a shopping trip with his wife and, and uh, these two guys jumped out of a black limousine with shotguns and uh, tried to cut him in two. He survived the wound, but uh, he said to his young protege Capone, he said, Al, he said, this is too dangerous for me. He says, I'm going back to New York and then did it. So Capone took over the Torio's operation in Chicago and within a matter of weeks, Dion O'Banion was dead. And they all went to the funeral and they all sent flowers and they were all very sad. And, you know, one, one criminal after another and the, the cars rolled through the streets of Chicago with Tommy guns pointed out the window. You know, a man named Thompson had invented what he called a submachine gun. It was designed to be used in World War I and he called it a trench broom. It could be held by an in, a single individual or fired 45 caliber bullets. But by the time the thing got into production, the war was over. Well, the market for the Tommy gun or the Thompson submachine gun you know, became gangland America. Jaime Weiss, head of the Jewish mob, uh, was quite religious. And uh, he had gotten into trouble with some of the Capone people. And uh, as he was coming out of Sacred Heart Cathedral in, in Chicago, he was murdered on the steps. Now the only gangsters left in, in Chicago or Bugs Moran on the one side and Al Capone on the other. Al Capone decided that it was time to teach the North Side Gang a lesson. So he made arrangements for a delivery of, of uh, bootleg whiskey to be delivered to a North Clark Street garage and the delivery was to be made about 10 o'clock in the morning on February 14th, 1929. At the appointed hour, a Cadillac limousine pulled up out front of the North Clark Street garage and two men in, in uh, overcoats got out and two policemen followed them into the North Clark Street garage. The policemen had the occupants of the garage line up against the wall and they frisked them and got rid of their handguns and the Tommy guns if they had any and so on. And then as they stood with their hands against the wall, the men with the overcoats took out machine guns and shot them all, killed all seven of them. And then the police took the machine guns and held them against the men in the overcoats and took them out and put them in fake police cars and drove away. No one knew who did it. Bugs Moran said he knew who did it. Only Capone kills like that. Do we really know who planned and executed the St. Valentine's Day massacre as it came to be known? Not really. Many think it was 
Capone's number one trigger man, Machine Gun Jack McGurn. But the result of the St. Valentine's Day massacre is that the president of the United States at the time, Herbert Hoover, demanded that the Treasury Department do something about these gangland killings, not just in Chicago, but literally all over the United States. And he said, I want this man, Capone, captured, tried, convicted, and sent to jail. In gangland Chicago, in between 1920 and 1929, there were between 300 and 600 gangland murders in Chicago. And this isn't, you know, they find somebody in a trunk in the morning. I mean, these are people who are getting shot down on the street. The Treasury Department put together a special unit headed by a man named Elliot Ness. If you're as old as I am, you remember that uh, there was a television series called The Untouchables, which starred Robert Stack as Elliot Ness. And later a film was made starring Kevin Costner in the same role. And they called themselves The Untouchables because they couldn't be bribed. And their job was to get enough evidence to convict Al Capone. And as much as they tried, they, they couldn't find, he, he, he was not, they couldn't prove that he had anything to do with the illegal whiskey. They couldn't figure out that he had anything to do with importing beer. They couldn't figure out that he was directly involved in any of the murders. Everybody knew that he was. He was suspected of everything, but they couldn't prove anything. Well, finally, the accountants got the idea that maybe we're attacking this problem from the wrong side. Maybe we should find out how much money he has and how much money he spends and if he pays the taxes on it. Well, Al Capone's bookkeeper was a man named Jake Greasy Thumb Goosey. And Ness and his people got a hold of Goosey and his books and began to discover that Al Capone annually made somewhere in the range of five to seven million dollars a year without showing any tax payments to anybody. Well, after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, other gangsters in other cities, New York and and Boston and Los Angeles and New Orleans and Kansas City got the idea that to have gangland killings all over the country is probably bad for business. So one of the gangsters, a man named Charlie Lucky Luciano from New York City organized a meeting to be held in Atlantic City in 1930. And they invited the major uh, gangsters from the major cities around the country. The Purple Gang from Detroit, Capone from Chicago, people from Kansas City and New Orleans and, and Buffalo and New York City and Boston and Philadelphia and so on. And they met in, in, in Atlantic City and what Luciano suggested to them was a national syndicate will stop the killing. We're only killing each other anyway, so stop the killing. If anybody's gonna be killed, it has to be by permission of, of a crime commission. And, and all the members from, from Los Angeles to, to Kansas City and, and Cleveland and so on were, would have a, a seat on the commission. And they would organize crime and put it in a way that it would be profitable and not particularly dangerous. Well, by now, Capone was at the meeting and, and a lot of the people who were there pointed specifically to him because of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and the publicity had, had given them all a bad name and it was bad for business, they said. Well, it was pretty much understood that Capone was a marked man, not only for the law, but among other gangsters. And he, on his way home from Atlantic City, he came through Philadelphia. And the Philadelphia police arrested Capone. And when they frisked him, they found out that he was carrying a concealed weapon. 
Well, he was tried and convicted and sentenced to a year in jail, and they put him in Eastern States Prison, downtown Philadelphia. If you've ever visited Eastern States Prison, one of the things that they point out to you is Al Capone's cell. You know, he's got a rug on the floor, he's got a radio, he's got a lamp, he's got an easy chair. This is not quite, you know, uh, bread and water for the rest of your life type of prison that everybody expects. Al Capone was treated very well by the prison guards at Eastern States. In the meantime, the accountants, when he got back to Chicago, had put together enough of a case that he could be brought up on charges for evading his income tax. They brought him to trial. He was indicted. And when, when the trial started, one of the court officials mentioned to the judge that he had good reason to believe that the jury in the Capone trial had been bribed. And it was a federal court. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't the local guy, it was the federal court. So the federal judge going on this tip, when the trial began, he ordered the bailiffs to go down the hall and pick the jury from two courtrooms down and bring them up to his courtroom and take the jury from his courtroom down there. So they traded juries. And then when the evidence was, was presented to a jury who had yet to be bribed, uh, they found Capone guilty of income tax evasion. Not murder, not bootlegging, not violation of the Volstead Act, but violation of the income tax laws. And he was uh, sentenced to pay a $10,000 fine, and he was sent to federal prison for 11 years. He was immediately transported from Chicago to the federal prison in Atlanta. And when Alcatraz opened in San Francisco Bay in the early 1930s, he was transferred by train from Atlanta to San Francisco and he went to Alcatraz. He was released from Alcatraz in 1939. Now, I'm sure that your math is as good as mine and 1933 to 1939 is only six years. He did not serve out his full term. The reason he was released is that by 1939, he uh, was a mental degenerate. He had contracted syphilis in his wilder, younger days, and it had just rotted his brain, so he uh, couldn't make sense of, of what was going on around him. He didn't always know the people, and, and so he was released. And, and uh, he spent the rest of his days at his uh, home on Palm Island, in Palm Island, Florida, just out, outside Miami. It was not at all unusual to see him fishing in the swimming pool. Uh, he, I don't think he ever got dressed again. He walked around most of the days in his pajamas and, and his robe and, and so forth. Did, did he know what was going on? Probably not. Probably not. He died in 1947 at 48 years old. They said that he was buried in uh, one of a Sacred Heart Cemetery in, in, in uh, Chicago. My son lives in Chicago. And on a visit there, I said to him, I said, Ted, I understand that Al Capone is buried in Sacred Heart Cemetery. How far is that from here? He said, it's just down the street. So he said, come on, we'll get in the car. And we went down the street to the cemetery, and Ted went in to the office and talked to the people there. And they said, no, he's not buried here. That, that was put in the paper so people would never know where his grave was. And Ted said, oh, so, so nobody knows where his grave is. And the fellow said, well, if, if you go out our front gate and turn right and go down the street about two and a half miles, you'll come to another cemetery. And if you turn in there and take the first road to the right and drive real slow down that, down that first road in that cemetery, you'll see a couple of graves that have uh, uh, arbovita bushes planted right in front of the tombstones. He said, no, I, I'm not going to tell you who's buried there, but if you got out and looked, it wouldn't be any secret to you. So we got in the car and we went down there. 
And this is what we saw. Behind these arbovita bushes is a huge tombstone that says Capone. And this is a footstone that says Alphonse Capone. And the date of his death, and you see flowers and coins and so forth on the footstone. In, in the rest of the cemetery, we saw mausoleums uh, owned by the O'Banion family and other mausoleums owned by the Torrio family and, and the Weiss family. So, you know, it isn't, yeah, Al's not the only one buried there. there. There's plenty more who are buried there. Well, 1929 not only saw the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, it also saw the crash of the stock market. And when the stock market crashed, that led enough of economic uncertainty that pretty soon uh, people who, everybody who wanted a car had one and everybody who wanted a refrigerator had one. So manufacturing in America started to dwindle and they started to lay off workers and people were out of a job. And by 1932, when Franklin Roosevelt was elected president, there were 15 million Americans unemployed. And they decided that enough was enough. Well, shortly after Franklin Roosevelt was elected, one of the things, once he was inaugurated, one of the things they wanted to do was to repeal the Volstead Act because it was the Volstead Act that defined intoxicating liquor. If you change the definition, you know, even though you haven't repealed the amendment, you, you can certainly get uh, uh, a modicum of moderate uh, beer onto the market and it looks like you're making progress. So they, def they defined uh, intoxicating liquor as anything stronger than 3.3% alcohol by volume, which made 3.2 beer legal. And then the 22nd or 21st Amendment was circulated among the states, and ultimately it repealed the 18th. The legacy of prohibition in America is nationally syndicated crime. Nationally syndicated crime costs America about $30 billion. I think that's right. 100,000 million, yeah, $30 billion a year. This is not the smuggling of drugs or anything like that. This is the money that's being uh, deprived of, of the American people through taxes, through graft, and so forth. No, no organization, a criminal organization can exist without the permission of the legitimate government. Al Capone, when he was in power, bragged that he had the city council and the judges and the mayor in his pocket. You know, they were all being bribed. The beat cops were being bribed, you know, because it was just so profitable. Revenue agents all over the country were being bribed. And, you know, it led to a, a level of lawlessness that, that America had never seen before. We hear about stories on the wild, in the Wild West, but, you know, this is the civilized East where this was happening. People became less inclined to obey the law, especially laws that they disagreed with. You know, they, you know, we can cheat a little bit here and a little bit there. One of the one of the major outcomes is, are are the bootleggers in, in the dry states in the South. You know, Eastern Tennessee, and Western North Carolina, and South Carolina, and so forth. You know, the bootleggers would would haul their moonshine to market and in Ford V8s and with a backseat full of cases of of moonshine whiskey. And as soon as you have young men and fast cars, the next thing you know, you have racing and the, you know, mine's better than yours and mine's faster than yours. And then they went out to prove it. And the out, the, the outcropping of all that is NASCAR. NASCAR can trace its origins directly to the bootleggers running shine in the middle of the night through the mountains of North, Car North Carolina and Tennessee. Was it a good idea to have prohibition? Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I think their motivation was, 
was at least it, it was it was noble, but I don't think they thought it through all the way. Today, you know, alcohol is produced commercially and it's regulated and it's taxed by the United States government. And there's pretty strong regulation on, on alcohol today. You don't, you don't see a lot of, of illegal alcohol. That's not to say that you can't go back in some of the hollers in Kentucky and West Virginia and find somebody making their own. You could probably find somebody making their own right here in Philadelphia. And the law says that heads of households are allowed to make up the 500 gallons a year for their own use. Whew. That's, that's, that's a lot of alcohol if you're going to drink it yourself. Questions? Feel free to unmute yourselves to ask Roger any questions. Not related to alcohol, but what was the Free Soil Party? What was Free Soil? Uh, free Soil was anti-slavery. They wanted to stop the extension of slavery into states in the West. It had already been prohibited in the, in the original Northwest, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan, and Wisconsin. But when slavery jumped the Mississippi River, it got into Missouri, which is clearly north of, of, uh, of most of Illinois, and they wanted to stop the extension of slavery west. The, the idea was they thought if they could eliminate the extension of the expansion of slavery, it would die on the vine of natural causes where it already existed. That's a theory that was never proven, by the way. Mm -hmm. And there's no picture of any free soil president in the White House. <laughs> any others? Roger, why do you think Pennsylvania has been so restrictive uh, with uh, alcohol, in particular, the strength of the Liquor Control Board? Uh, I, I think that, that each state, uh, well, first, the, the, the stock answer, and I'll tell you what my wife always said, nobody cares what I think. <laughs> but but the, the, every state puts in their own system. And... Pennsylvania has state liquor stores and they will sell beer or they will sell wine and, and, and whiskey and other uh, spirits through the state stores. And yet, and it's relaxed a little bit now, but it used to be if you wanted to buy beer, you could only buy it by the case and you could only buy it from a beer distributor. And I thought that, I think that they, the, the Commonwealth believed that that was a way that they could regulate it and keep track of it. And, and, and control it to some degree. Now you can buy uh, smaller amounts. You don't have to buy a whole case. You can buy a six pack or 12 pack, or you can buy one bottle at a time if you want to. And you can buy wine and beer in grocery stores in limited amounts today. Other states uh, have, they have state stores which will only sell whiskey, but you can buy beer and wine in grocery stores and, and drug stores. Uh, other states, you can buy anything you want to anywhere you want to. You know, all you have to have is a liquor license, and you can they can sell it at at uh, the CVS if they wanted to. I I was in a a Wawa uh, not long ago, and then Wawa had a had an alcohol license and a separate cash register to sell alcohol at the Wawa. And they, so they're selling gasoline on the island, and they're selling alcohol inside. And you know, so. I think Pennsylvania is, is beginning to, to, to lighten their, their rules a touch. But there are, there are still places in America where it's dry. You know, alcohol is prohibited. Uh, Shelby County, Tennessee, for example, which is the home of, of uh, Jack Daniels Distillery. It's a dry county. You can take a tour of the, of the distillery and, and you can order a case of Jack Daniels and they'll ship it to your house, but they can't sell it to you on the premises because it's a dry county. And there are plenty of places in Kentucky that are dry and they have the alcoholics to prove it. You know, a lot of moonshine going on in those mountains even yet. We have 
we don't have that problem now that we did once. But the template that organized crime put together to control the sale of illegal alcohol is now used to sell illegal everything else. The smuggling of, of drugs into America and so on. And I will tell you that the, that the drug trade cannot exist without the permission of, of the officials. It, it just can't. Are they being bribed? That wouldn't surprise me. And, you know, 88,000 miles of coastline, as good as the U.S. Navy is, as good as the Coast Guard is, they can't patrol it all. They just can't. So, you know, it's up to each individual person whether they choose to break the law or not. Any others? Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Rogers. Oh, always good to have you. Good to see you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care now. Thank you. Take care.